Today, let us share the Word of God with a sermon titled, Those Who Rely on God's Word and Those Who Do Not. Through this subject, let us see the end result of those who relied on God's Word and of those who did not. The Word of God has great power. The Word of God raises the dead. The Word of God has the authority to forgive sins committed in heaven, to grant us eternal life, and to lead us to the kingdom of heaven. The Word of God also has the authority to appoint us as the royal priesthood in heaven. Even though we know that God has great authority, in our doubt, we might question. God is so powerful that He created the heavens and the earth by His Word. Then, shouldn't it be easy for God to make all people hear His Word, repent, and return to Him in an instant? If God has such power, why does He instruct us to do the work of the gospel? God already answered all of our questions about why He allowed us to participate in the gospel work. God asked people to carry out the gospel work, not because He is powerless, but because there is a certain will of God. If we fully understand this, then we would never disobey God's word. The gospel work can be done only by those who realize the will of God. God could have allowed the Israelites to enter the land of Canaan by guiding them on an easy and direct path rather than leading them through the desert where they experienced all kinds of affliction for a period of 40 years. Why do you think God led them through such an environment? Everyone, with one word, God created the earth, the seas, the birds of the air, and all kinds of trees. God even divided the Red Sea. Do you believe that God did all of this? God created the heavens and the earth, which did not exist. How much more easier would it be for Him to gather all His people that He created? Then, don't you think that God must have a reason for carrying out the gospel work through us? God says, preach the gospel. However, while preaching the gospel, you will go through many hardships and persecution. Are there any parents who would like to see their beloved children suffer persecution and trials? No parent would want to see this. Nevertheless, the reason God allows us to go through such sufferings can be seen in the history of the Israelites being freed from Egypt and entering the land of Canaan 3,500 years ago, which occurred as a shadow. People who depend on the Word of God always witness miracles in their lives. But those who live in disobedience without relying on the Word of God cannot help but live in a hellish environment. Such people cannot remain in the truth, but will eventually be destroyed, just like the Israelites. Due to many temptations and distractions around them, the Israelites came to forget God and their ultimate purpose after being emancipated from Egypt. We must keep in mind that those who act this foolishly will leave God. It takes less than a second or less than a minute for God to accomplish anything. However, there is a reason why God waits and why God waits so patiently. Today, let us find the reason through the words of the Bible. First of all, let us confirm the power of God's words. Let's see Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And God said, Let there be light. And there was light. God saw that the light was good, and He separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness He called night. And there was evening, and there was morning the first day. And God said, Let there be an expanse between the waters to separate water from water. So God made the expanse and separated the water under the expanse from the water above it, and it was so. 
God called the expanse sky, and there was evening, and there was morning the second day. Here, we can realize something crucial. What tool did God use in His creation work? It was His Word. Everything was done according to what God said. If God says, Heavenly angels, gather all our heavenly family members, even the youngest one, this place will be crowded. It will be done immediately. God can find all the children of Zion, even the youngest one, in an instant. God can also defeat all the wicked in an instant. In the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 13, when the servants asked the owner, Sir, do you want us to go and pull up the weeds? He responded, Let both the wheat and the weeds grow together until the harvest. Why do you think God allows us to grow in such a difficult environment? We should find God's will in it. We should keep in mind that everything God has created in this world contains His purpose and His will. By looking at the history of creation in Genesis chapter 1, we can easily understand how powerful the Word of God is. Can human power create the heavens? No. Can human power create the earth? No. However, God has the power to create the heavens and the earth without using any tool other than His Word. Everyone, the work of salvation too can be accomplished in a day if God says, it will be done in one day. Or in a second, if God says, it will be done in one second. We believe in Almighty God, who has such magnificent power. Let's move on to 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 5. But they deliberately forget that long ago, by God's word, the heavens existed, and the earth was formed out of water and by water. Those who do not follow God's will and disobey Him deliberately forget that all things were created by God's Word. In 2 Peter chapter 3, it is emphasized that the heavens and the earth were made by God's Word. The work of God's power is scattered like pieces of a puzzle throughout the Bible. However, when we put them all together, we can understand that just as the earth and our environment are created by God's Word, the Word of God has great power because everything can be accomplished according to His Word. Let's look at the Gospel of Luke, chapter 5, verse 1. One day, as Jesus was standing by the lake of Gennesaret, with the people crowding around Him and listening to the Word of God, He saw at the water's edge two boats, left there by the fishermen who were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, and asked him to put out a little from shore. Then he sat down and taught the people from the boat. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, Put out into deep water and let down the nets for a catch. Simon answered, Master, we've worked hard all night and haven't caught anything. But because you say so, because why? Because you say so, I will let down the nets. When they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. Those who rely on God's Word can experience miracles like this. On the other hand, those who disobey His Word cannot see the kingdom of heaven but are always put into painful and distressing circumstances. Let's see verse 6. When they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. Verse 7 says, So they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both boats, so full that they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and said, Go away from me, Lord. I am a sinful man. Peter was not able to catch any fish all night. But when he suddenly caught a large number of fish, he immediately knew that this had occurred because of a miraculous power. After that, he admitted, I am a sinful man. How can the Holy One come near this sinner? Please leave me. 
everyone, those who live relying on God's Word can always experience this kind of power, just as Peter did. Those who realize the power of the Word of God will make efforts to live according to His Word. As in the case of Apostle Peter, Apostle John also tells us about the authority of God's Word that we can experience in our daily lives. Let's look at John chapter 2, verse 1. On the third day, a wedding took place at Cana in Galilee. Jesus' mother was there, and Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. When the wine was gone, Jesus' mother said to him, They have no more wine. Dear woman, why do you involve me? Jesus replied, My time has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, Do whatever he tells you. Nearby stood six stone water jars, the kind used by the Jews for ceremonial washing, each holding from 20 to 30 gallons. Jesus said to the servants, Fill the jars with water. So they filled them to the brim. Then he told them, Now draw some out and take it to the master of the banquet. They did so, and the master of the banquet tasted the water that had been turned into wine. He did not realize where it had come from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew. Then he called the bridegroom aside and said, Everyone brings out the choice wine first, and then the cheaper wine, after the guests have had too much to drink, but you have saved the best till now. This, the first of his miraculous signs, Jews perform at Cana in Galilee. He thus revealed his glory, and his disciples put their faith in him. The power of God's word is amazing. When they just filled the jar with water, as he said, the master was surprised at his taste. It became the best wine. God can do anything at any time, whenever he wants. We might think, if God destroys all the wicked at once, selects only the righteous, and takes them to heaven, it can all be accomplished in just one day. Why doesn't God do that? Let's go to Genesis chapter 22, verse 1. Sometime later, God tested Abraham. He said to him, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Then God said, Take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the region of Moriah. Sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains I will tell you about. Even in the situation where God commanded Abraham to sacrifice his son, he always remembered the power of God's word, Abraham thought. As God promised, I will make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky. His profound will must be contained in his command to offer my son Isaac as a sacrifice. When Abraham took his son to Mount Moriah and was about to sacrifice him as a burnt offering, God saw the faith of Abraham. Faith is not just saying, God, I love you, with our mouth and lips, but faith is doing what appears to be impossible in obedience to God's command. God looks at our hearts. For this reason, Abraham was granted the great title of the forefather of faith. Brothers and sisters, those who rely on God's word always receive these amazing miracles and blessings. God's word has the authority and power to make the dead live again, to allow the eternally unforgivable sinners to receive the forgiveness of sins, to let them change into immortal beings, and to create all the amazing ways for them to return to heaven where they were once prohibited from entering. When we keep this in mind, we will all be able to live such a gracious life like Abraham, Peter, and all the forefathers of faith. Let's take a look at Genesis chapter 6. Genesis chapter 6, verse 13. So God said to Noah, I am going to put an end to all people, for the earth is filled with violence because of them. I am surely going to destroy both them and the earth. So make yourself an ark of cypress wood, make rooms in it, and coat it with pitch inside and out. This is how you are to build it. The ark is to be 450 feet long, 75 feet wide, and 45 feet high. Make a roof for it. God gives 
these commands to Noah. Let's see verse 22. Noah did everything just as God commanded him. In any age, those who live relying on the Word of God always experience amazing miracles. Abraham also experienced the amazing and gracious miracle on Mount Moriah. After all, didn't Mount Moriah become the site of the Jerusalem temple? The place where Abraham had been commanded to sacrifice Isaac became the very place where priests slaughter sheep and presented burnt offerings every day according to the prayer time. There, the city of Jerusalem was built as the place of worship to God. Though it may seem that God commanded Abraham to do that without any specific reason, there was a purpose and will contained in it. God put prophetic meanings in the lives of the forefathers of faith in the Old Testament. Didn't God reveal a prophecy of Jesus' sacrifice through the sacrifice of sheep, goats, and other animals for a period of 1,500 years? It was a shadow to show us that Jesus Christ, the one and only Son, who is the reality, would be sacrificed on the cross. Whatever we do, we must rely on God's Word and never forget how powerful God's Word is. As long as we obey God, we can see miracles and even participate in His invisible and wonderful providence. Let's look at Jeremiah chapter 21, verse 8. Furthermore, tell the people, this is what the Lord says. See, I'm setting before you the way of life and the way of death. There are always two ways before us, the way of life and the way of death. In our eyes, the way on the right might look like the way of life, and the way on the left might look like the way of death. However, the Bible says that God's thoughts are not our thoughts. Shouldn't we all obey the guidance of God, who is a source of life until the end? In order to obey God's Word until the end, we must be able to recognize the power of God's Word. Let us see what God says in Isaiah chapter 55, verse 8. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. As the rain and the snow come down from heaven, and do not return to it without watering the earth and making it bud and flourish, so that it yields seed for the sower and bread for the eater, so is my word that goes out from my mouth. It will not return to me empty, but will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which I sent it. God says, as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my thoughts higher than your thoughts. Look at the stars spread across the night sky. The existence of the earth is extremely insignificant. In the eyes of God, the earth is minuscule, like a speck of dust on the scales. But we regard it as everything. Then, what should we rely on? Rely on the Word of God. If our thoughts are completely different from God's thoughts, we should follow God's thoughts, even though we might think that our way appears to be better. Then, why doesn't God use His omnipotent power to complete the gospel? Let's find out what God's will is through Deuteronomy chapter 8. Let's see Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 1. Be careful to follow every command I am giving you today, so that you may live and increase and may enter and possess the land that the Lord promised an oath to your forefathers. Doesn't it mean that we should live according to the Word of God? Let's see verse 2. Remember how the Lord your God led you all the way in the desert these 40 years to humble you and to test you in order to know what was in your heart, whether or not you would keep His commands. 
He humbled you, causing you to hunger, and then feeding you with manna, which neither you nor your fathers had known, to teach you that man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. Your clothes did not wear out, and your feet did not swell during these forty years. Know then in your heart that as a man disciplines his son, so the Lord your God disciplines you. Observe the commands of the Lord your God, walking in His ways and revering Him. For the Lord your God is bringing you into a good land, a land with streams and pools of water, with springs flowing in the valleys and hills, a land with wheat and barley, vines and fig trees, pomegranates, olive oil, and honey, a land where bread will not be scarce, and you will lack nothing, a land where the rocks are iron, and you can dig copper out of the hills. When you have eaten and are satisfied, praise the Lord your God for the good land He has given you. Be careful that you do not forget the Lord your God, failing to observe His commands, His laws, and His decrees that I am giving you this day. The Bible testifies that there was a reason why God caused the Israelites to wander in the desert for 40 years, instead of allowing them to enter the land of Canaan through an easy and direct path. God sometimes humbled them, sometimes caused them to hunger, and even fed them with manna from heaven, which they had never seen before. In this way, God tested the Israelites to examine whether or not they had faith in Him. In the same way, those who have no faith in God are not allowed to enter the kingdom of heaven. In the wilderness, people without faith were filtered out. Since they had no faith in God, the Israelites disobeyed Him when their opinions differed from His or their inconveniences were not resolved. Though they claimed to believe in God, they regarded Him as only a tool to make their life convenient. Today, we should deeply engrave this question in our hearts. Why did God allow this situation to occur to the Israelites? Don't you know Lazarus, who is recorded in the Gospel of John, chapter 11? Wasn't he once dead, but he got up and walked out of the tomb alive? Lazarus' sister, Martha, tried to prevent Jesus from entering Lazarus' tomb, saying to Jesus, Lord, by this time, there is a bad order, as he has been dead for four days. You don't need to be so concerned about us. Jesus responded, He who believes in me will live, even though he dies. And whoever lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? Martha doubted, but she answered, Yes, Lord, though I believe I've never seen anyone who died and came back to life. So Jesus let her witness this miracle. Lazarus, come out. At that moment, Lazarus walked out with his whole body wrapped with strips of linen. Why did God show such favor toward Lazarus? Among the many lepers, why did God heal only a few of them? God does not want people to believe in Him only because of such miracles. Sometimes, God humbles His people, causes them to hunger, puts them in unfavorable circumstances, but sometimes He puts them in favorable circumstances. Through all these processes, God is looking for and selecting the people who will not lose their faith in God, even until the very end. We are sinners from heaven. After coming to the earth, sinners must not take advantage of God. For example, if people believe that God is only there to serve them, thinking, I need God to do this or that for me, they are wrong. If sinners were left alone, they would be destined to be sent to eternal hell. God came to this earth for the heavenly sinners who deserve such punishment and once again granted them the amazing grace of redemption. God forgave all the sins that they committed in the past. Who is allowed to return to the heavenly home? Only the people who have faith in God. Then what is faith? In order to let us know what faith is, God allows many different situations to occur around us every day. In those situations, 
God determines whether we have faith in Him or not. How does Solomon distinguish between the true mother and the false mother? When DNA testing did not exist, he differentiated between the true mother and the false mother by the true mother's natural love and compassion for her child. This was how he could recognize the true mother. God is examining whether people truly believe in Him or not, even though they say, Lord, Lord, with their mouths. The Israelites said, I believe in God. I do believe. However, when they were put in a difficult situation, how did they treat God, though they claimed to believe in Him and be His people? They turned their backs on God and betrayed Him. The Israelites complained, saying, Wasn't it better when we were in the land of Egypt? Why did you bring us into this desert and make us starve to death? Hearing them constantly say this, God was heartbroken. Once again, He filtered out those who did not have faith. When the wheat and the chaff are together, it is hard to distinguish between the two. However, when the wind blows, all the chaff will be blown away. The only thing that will remain is the wheat. God will surely separate the two. Let's look at Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 2 again. Remember how the Lord your God led you all the way in the desert these 40 years to humble you and to test you in order to know what was in your heart, whether or not you would keep His commands. God tested them to know whether or not they would obey God's word and whether or not they believed in God. In order to teach the Israelites the truth of the Sabbath day, God gave them manna every day for five days, but gave them twice as much on the sixth day, the day before the Sabbath day. On the seventh day, the Sabbath, no manna rained down from heaven. God created all situations in the lives of the Israelites so that they could obey God's word. Didn't God train all of them in the wilderness? so that they would not forget God's decrees, ordinances, and laws, even after entering the land of Canaan? God did everything. Even if the Israelites did not march around Jericho seven times, God could have still destroyed it. Even if Moses did not stretch out his staff over the Red Sea, God could have still divided it. In the same way, even in a moment, God can remove all the difficulties that trouble us. But the reason why He does not do so is that He wants us to always depend on Him by seeking and praying to Him. His profound will contained in this is to make us the royal priesthood when we return to the kingdom of heaven. Those who do not believe in God while living on this earth will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Let's see Hebrews chapter 3, verse 7. So as the Holy Spirit says, Today, if you hear His voice, do not harden your hearts, as you did in the rebellion, during the time of testing in the desert, where your fathers tested and tried me, and for forty years saw what I did. That is why I was angry with that generation. And I said, Their hearts are always going astray, and they have not known my ways. So I declared on oath in my anger, they shall never enter my rest. Since Canaan represents the kingdom of heaven, those who disobeyed God because their hearts have gone astray cannot enter heaven. Let's see verse 12. See to it, brothers, that none of you has a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God, but encourage one another daily, as long as it is called today, so that none of you may be hardened by sins, deceitfulness. We have come to share in Christ if we hold firmly till the end the confidence we had at first. As has just been said, today, if you hear His voice, do not harden your hearts, as you did in the rebellion. Who were they who heard and rebelled? Were they not all those Moses led out of Egypt? And with whom was He angry for forty years? Was it not with those who sinned? whose bodies fell in the desert? And to whom did God swear that they would never enter His rest, if not to those who disobeyed? So we see that they were not able to enter. Why were they not able to enter? Because of their unbelief. Their disobedience is a sign 
through which we can easily recognize the unbelief in their hearts. Hebrews chapter 3, verse 18 says, They would never enter His rest, if not to those who disobeyed. So we see that they were not able to enter because of their unbelief. Everyone, in our daily lives, Almighty God is constantly sifting through those who have true faith from those who do not. Instead of focusing on all the circumstances that we encounter, let us ask ourselves, how can I obey God's will and live my life depending only on God's Word through this situation? Brothers and sisters, we must always be conscientious of God. We should also give thanks in all circumstances for the rest of our lives. Let us press on to know God all the more and graciously participate in the providence of father and mother. Hoping that you and I will revere God and be blessed every day. I would like to conclude this sermon. Thank you very much.